we're going to talk about focusing on the future. How many of you have already made some, some at least temporary plans for retirement? Did you raise your hand? You've made some plans for retirement? Some of you are already retired, right? Okay. A little late now, isn't it? So. I've been thinking more and more about that in recent years. The older I get, you know, the more I think about retirement years, and it sure creeps up on you in a hurry, doesn't it? And so that's a good thing to do, to plan ahead, to make sure that you're going to have the, the resources that you need to take care of your responsibilities and everything when you come to that point in your life. And so all of us understand what it means to, to think ahead, to plan ahead, to look for, forward to the future, and to try and plan out your life as best you can. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning, looking ahead, thinking about what's around the corner. Um, where do you think you're going to be a year from now with regard to your, uh, your, your situation, whether it's uh, your income, your job? Some of you may not be living here any longer. Um, where are you going to be a year from now with regards to things like that? Where are you going to be in your your walk with the Lord. You have some plans, definite plans, about how you're going to serve Him in the, the years ahead. So think ahead. One year, two years, three, five, ten, maybe even beyond that, depending on how old you are, right? As to how many, how many days you have left, how many years you have left, and what you're going to do in the way of planning for the future, thinking about the future for you and for your family. And specifically think about what it is that God wants to do in your life with your future. I believe that uh, we'll see that this morning, that God has specific plans for every single one of us as his children. And so that's what we want to talk about this morning, focusing on the future. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 23, 18, There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. I want you to take a good look at that word hope. Uh, the word hope literally means to believe in something with expectation or with anticipation. To believe in something, that something's going to happen, that something's going to come to pass. And to look forward to that with uh, some, uh, some element of ex expectation and anticipation. You really are, are anxiously looking forward to that happening uh, in the future. And so that's what it means to have hope. Uh, the Bible talks about our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that's talking about our faith, our belief that we're going to be with Him throughout eternity. And so we look forward to being with Him someday in heaven. And so uh, that's the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31, 17, Your future is filled with hope, declares the Lord. Now, it's interesting to understand the situation there. The Israelites were, were going into exile, into Babylon. They were being conquered by another nation. And even in the midst of despair, even in the midst of trouble and, and heartache and suffering, the prophet Jeremiah tells them that your future is filled with hope. God never forsakes us. God never turns his back on us. And so even when we're going through a tough time or we're going through some kind of a, a crisis in our life or a struggle or a time of uncertainty, there is always hope. There is always a future that God has planned out for us, that He's declared that we're going to have, that we're going to look forward to. And so think about this this morning. This might be a time for a new start for some of you, a new beginning for you um, in your spiritual life and maybe in some other ways as well. You know, what is it that God wants to do in your life in the remaining time that you have, however long that is? It may be months, years, it could be a long time or a short time. What is it that God wants to do in your life with the time that you have left here on this earth. That's really an important thing to think about, really important to, to dwell on. And so we're going to look this morning at, at how you can have a successful future. How can you can know for sure that God's blessings are going to be on the, the plans that you make looking forward from this point. And how you can know that it's going to be uh, you know, what God wants you to do, have that success that God wants you to have. The first thing you got to do if you want to be successful in your future, looking forward from this point forward, is to not dwell on the past. Don't dwell on the past. Sometimes we get all stirred up and caught up in thinking about things that have happened in the past, many times negative things, and sometimes that can hinder us or it can cause us heartache or uncertainty, and, and we're so caught up in thinking about what's happened in the past that we can't seem to move forward. 
You know, that's water under the bridge. We need to just let that go. Now, we can learn from those mistakes, but we need to be careful that we don't let it, let it harm us as we're looking forward. In Luke 9, uh, 62, Jesus said, Anyone who begins to plow a field but keeps looking back is of no use in the kingdom of God. So Jesus used an analogy there of, of a farmer plowing a, a row, plowing a field. He says, if you're plowing this, this row, he said, if you're looking back, then you're of no use for the kingdom of God. What's he talking about? Some of you know, some of you may not have a clue. But he's talking about keeping that row straight, right? Doing it properly, being focused on the future. If you don't look ahead, you're not going to plow straight, right? You can't be looking back as you're plowing or you're going to go off in all different directions. You know, I've shared this before, but I always remember when I was a boy, uh, I got to go spend a, a week or so with my grandparents on occasion. They lived in Oklahoma. And I remember one time I, I went and uh, uh, my grandfather had this amazing garden in his backyard. You know, that's what kind of kept him busy after he retired. And it was just amazing. The entire backyard was this huge garden. And so he was always planting things and, and everything. And so on one trip that I went to stay with him, uh, he had me out there helping him in the garden. You know, it was a lot of work. I mean, he worked in this garden from sunup till sundown every day. You know, it was a big deal. And so he had me out there in my first experience in plowing, you know, and had this plow and everything. And I remember he said something like, I want you to look up there and pick out a point straight ahead and look right at that and keep your eyes focused on that as you're pushing that plow. Because if you don't do that, you're going to get the rows crooked. And so I remember that. That's what Jesus is talking about. When you're thinking about your future, you're thinking about looking forward, planning your life, not, not just the, you know, the physical things of life or the material things of life, but the spiritual things of life as well. As you're planning that out, you need to be looking forward. You need to be focused on looking ahead instead of looking at your past mistakes, your past troubles. You ever feel like, you know, you've messed up so badly that you just can't fix it? You know, I've just messed up something. Something in my life is such a mess that I could never unravel it. Well, that may be true, but dwelling on it and thinking about it is not going to help at all, is it? We all make mistakes. We all go off in the wrong direction from time to time. Sometimes we do things or we say things that we can't take back. And sometimes there are consequences to that, aren't there? And we just have to deal with it. We just have to move forward. You can't get caught up in looking back if you're trying to serve the Lord and you're, you're trying to move forward in a positive way. And so, stop looking back. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.13 says, I'm still not all that I should be, but I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Now, Paul had really messed up in the past, hadn't he? Paul had good intentions, but Paul actually was one of those who hunted down Christians and had them put to death because he misunderstood what was happening, what God was doing. He didn't, didn't recognize that Jesus was the Messiah at first until Jesus had that encounter with him on the road to Damascus. And so Paul knows what it's like to have a past that was messed up, where he had really made a mess of things and done some terrible things. He had put people to death, literally. And so he knows what he's talking about here as he's sharing this. And as the Holy Spirit inspires him to say this, he said, I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I can't let that hinder me. Imagine if he just sat around all the time and stewed over the bad things that he had done in the past instead of getting out and doing the positive things that he was doing in the future. He did some incredible things in his service for the Lord. And it's because he kept looking forward. He kept looking ahead instead of looking back. You got some kind of a skeleton in your closet that you're ashamed of? We all do, don't we? All of us do. I, I'm quite certain probably everybody in here has done something in the past that you wouldn't want anybody else to know about. Maybe nobody else does know, right? Except you and the Lord, right? And uh, you'd like to keep it that way, right? We all mess up. We're all sinners, aren't we? And sometimes we do some things that we, we, we surprise ourselves, don't we? I never thought I would do something like that. But you can't undo it once it's done. And so just let it go. You need to move on. All of that is under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's grace is bigger than all of our sins. And so no matter what you've done, you shouldn't be punishing yourself and, 
and continually reminding yourself of those things because that doesn't serve any positive purpose. Really, that's just the devil trying to hinder you from doing what God wants you to do moving forward. So just let it go. Now again, you may be suffering some consequences for that. You may have to, to deal with that. There may be reminders that come and go because of that. You can't do anything about that except just pray and move on and say, Lord, help me to put that behind me and forgive yourself. Sometimes it's harder for us to forgive ourselves than it is for us to forgive somebody else. Forgive yourself even as Christ has forgiven you and just move forward. There's three things about your past. First of all, you can't change it. There's nothing you can do about that. No sense in worrying about it. My dad used to say, you know, you know, you know what we're worrying about it is something you can never change anyway. Worrying about it won't make any difference. It won't change a thing. And so don't worry about that. Just think about how you can move forward and make some positive moves in your life that will help you to achieve God's will. Stop stewing on the past. Second thing is you, you can learn from it. You can learn from your mistakes. Isn't experience the best teacher? You know, you can read all about something and you can study about something. You can be trained to do something. But until you actually get out there and do it and you experience it yourself and you begin to make some mistakes and learn from those mistakes and correct those mistakes, you're not going to really be as proficient as you want to be at anything, right? You have to learn from your mistakes and that's called experience. Sometimes we have bad, have bad experiences. And so just learn from it. Say, okay, well, I shouldn't have done that. I'm not going to do that again, right? Once burnt, lesson learned, right? When Aaron was a little boy, in a, one of the first houses we lived in, we had an electric stove and it had that old coil up there, you know, on the top. And you may have one like that. And, uh, uh, you know, you turn that thing on and you heat it up quickly and put it on high and that thing gets red hot, you know. Well, he was just a little boy and we, we, we lost sight of him there for a few minutes and you know what he did. He could, he could just barely see that up there, something glowing up there. And he thought, man, I need to touch that, you know. Well, he did, but he never did it again. He did it one time. It didn't hurt him badly. It just burned his finger a little bit. But it was enough to teach him a lesson. I'm not going to do that ever again. And so we make mistakes and we get burned sometimes. And we have to learn from that and just move on. You know, don't, don't hold it against yourself forever and ever and ever. Let it be a learning experience. Then another thing about your past is that you can overcome it. With, uh, with God's help, all things are possible, right? All things are possible with the Lord. And so the Lord will give you the strength and, and ability to overcome any problem that you have in your life, no matter what it is. He can help you to have victory over that and to move forward and to achieve some wonderful things in the time that you have left here on this earth. So I think the most important thing to, to think about as you think about the future is to forget about the past. Let it lie. Let it be behind you and start right where you're at and start looking forward and be focused on what lies out in front of you. Do the best you can to stay focused on the future instead of being focused on the past. Second thing you need to do to have success in the future is to realize that your future has already been planned out by the Lord. That kind of takes a lot of the pressure off, doesn't it? Say, so, well, I got to plan this and I got to plan that. And certainly we do have to make some plans on you know, retirement and things like that. But I'm going to tell you something. God already has everything already planned out for your life. You just have to tap into that. You just have to come to understand exactly what it is that He wants you to do and how He wants you to go about it. You do that through meditation and prayer and the study of Scripture and discussions with other folks and asking the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and guidance to make the right decisions in every aspect of your life, your family, your job, you know, whatever it may be, schooling, whatever it is. You pray about it, you reflect on it, you, you ask God to give you wisdom and guidance, and then you trust the feelings that the Lord gives you. You trust that, that wisdom that God gives you to make the right decision. The book of James says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he'll give it to you. He'll give you that guidance and that wisdom if you'll have faith and trust in him and believe in him to show you the way to go. And so, your future has already been planned out by the Lord. In Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, Jeremiah says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace and not disaster, plans to give you a future filled with hope. And so God has already planned out everything that He wants to take place in your life from this point forward. In fact, He had that all planned out before you were even born, right? 
before I went into the ministry, I was a, I was a draftsman in an engineering office for about 10 years. I, I worked as a draftsman, and uh, the Lord was dealing with me during that time about being a, a preacher, but I, I really resisted that, and I just kind of pushed that thought aside and that feeling aside, and I was working as a draftsman in this engineering office, and right here in Amarillo, and our office at that time did all of the, the mechanical engineering for all the architects in town. We were the only one in town. And so they'd have to go out of town to use someone else. So most of them used our, our little office. There was just a few of us in this office. So the architect would send over the plans for a building that, that was being built. And we would take the plans and we would go through there and we would design the heating and air conditioning and plumbing plans, electrical, we did electrical as well, and would draw up the plans for that part of the project. And so I did that for many years. So I know how to read a set of plans. And I understand the importance of planning things out. You know, if you don't, if you don't plan things out, a building, a complicated building, it's going to be a mess. You know, you don't just go out there and start building. Now, if it's something simple, you can. But if it's complicated at all, you got to have a good set of plans. you got to plan things out and anticipate problems and all of that and figure out how everything is going to fit together. It's kind of like doing a puzzle. And so you put this thing all together before you begin to build the building, right? And then you wait for an eternity to get approval to do all that, right? But that's just the way it works. And so God is the master architect. The Lord has already planned out your life. Everything that he wants to take place in your life, the things that he wants you to do, the difference that he wants you to make, the job he wants you to have, the interaction he wants you to have with other people, the church he wants you to be a part of, the ministry that he wants you to have. Every single aspect of your life has been planned out by the Lord. It's all been planned. And we have to do our best to tap into that, to understand exactly what that plan is. So really the Lord has done all the difficult work for us. We just have to figure out exactly how we plug into his plan that he's already laid out for us. And it's really not that difficult to do. If you're very sincere about it and you're seeking the Lord's will and you're in the center of God's will and you're spending time in the scriptures doing all the basic things that you need to do as a believer in Christ, I guarantee you he's going to reveal his will to you. He's going to show you the direction that he wants you to go. In Ecclesiastes 6.10, the Bible says, Everything has already been decided. It was known long ago what each person would be. So there's no use arguing with God about your destiny. Just follow the will of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you in the things that he wants you to do. Now there's this thing that sometimes gets in the way. It's called free will. We can decide to go an opposite way from the way that God wants us to go, right? We've all been there, right? Some of you are there now. And when you do that, you begin to find yourself frustrated. You begin to find yourself in trouble. You don't have that joy in your salvation that you ought to have. You don't have that peace in your heart to know that you're going in the right direction. There's, there's discouragement sometimes. Now, we're all going to face some of those things, of course, occasionally anyway. But when you get outside of God's will, when you step out of God's plan for your life, it's not going to go well for you. And so the Lord gives you the freedom of choice to make that decision as to whether you're going to follow His will and do it His way or do it your way. God's got it all planned out, but you can still say no, right? You ever wonder what would have happened if Moses had said no? That would be kind of hard to do standing in front of that burning bush, right? But no, I'm not going to do that. He tried to, didn't he? He tried to talk the Lord out of it. No, no, this is what we're going to do. But we can say no. And if we do say no, God's already got an alternate plan, right? There's a plan B. Now, God already knows what plan B is. Plan B is plan A for him because he knew before you did it what you were going to do, right? It's kind of confusing, but he knows what you're going to do. But he has a plan and a desire for you to do a certain thing. And if you refuse to do that and you bow up against it, God's got an alternative plan. He's got someone else that can step in and do that if you refuse to do it. Or he can, he can make changes in your life. You go off in the wrong direction. God is a God of grace, and he can help you to come back to where you need to be. Sometimes we go the long way around to get there, right? You know, can you get there from here? Yeah, but sometimes it takes a while, right? Instead of taking a, a straight shot at it, sometimes we go the long way around to get where the Lord wants us to be. But if we'll follow the Holy Spirit, if we'll be receptive to Him, if we'll be obedient to Him, if we'll be submissive to Him, I guarantee you that He'll lead you in the right direction. 
Just as the Lord led the, the Israelites through the wilderness with that, uh, that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire, and all they had to do was follow Him everywhere they went, and He provided for them everywhere they went, He'll do the exact same thing for you. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will show you the way to go if you will be receptive to that. And if you bow up against it, He's, he's got an alternate route, an alternate way for you to, to get to where He wants you to be. So, if you want to be successful this point forward, stop worrying about that stuff that's behind you, that, that past that uh, is uh, not what you really would like it to be. Realize that God's already planned out your future for you. And then thirdly, you need to reflect on what God's will is for your life. What is it exactly that God wants to do in your life right now? King David wrote in Psalm 31, 14, I'm trusting you, O Lord, you are my God. My future is in your hands. And so David said, I, I'm trusting in you. I'm, I'm believing in you. And I'm asking you to show me the way to go. And I'm just going to put all my hope and trust in you. And know that you're going to show me exactly what it is you want me to do. He also wrote in Psalm 37, verse 37, Look at those who are honest and good. For a wonderful future lies before those who love peace. But the wicked will be destroyed. They have no future. And so the Lord wants you to have peace. Primarily he wants you to have peace with him. He wants you to have peace in the world as well, but He wants you to have peace with Him. And if you'll trust in Him and rely upon Him, He'll show you exactly what it is that He wants you to do. Sometimes folks will come to me and say, well, I don't know what God's will is. How, how can I know what God's will is for my life? And, uh, you know, I guess they think I can tell them. Well, I don't know. You have to pray about that. You have to seek the Lord's will about that. You have to meditate on those things. And again, the closer you are to the Lord, the more clear it will become. Sometimes it's cloudy because you're not very close to the Lord. And so get as close to the Lord as you can, and things will begin to clear up. The clouds will lift. And you'll, oh, okay, I see exactly what it is the Lord wants me to do. Now, that's happened to me many, many times. And I'm sure it has for you, too. Sometimes we flounder, and we struggle, and we go off in the wrong direction, and we're frustrated. And finally, we get really, really serious about seeking God's will. Lord, what is it you want me to do? Show me the way to go. And then it begin, begins to become clear. God will show you exactly what He wants you to do. How do you get this peace? What is true peace anyway? Well, peace knows, first of all, that my sins are forgiven. Isn't that real peace? Remember when you came to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Remember how that, that burden, many people say it's like a weight is just lifted off of you when you come to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And you realize that all of your sins have been forgiven. All your past mistakes, all your current sins, all your future sins, they're all under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that you've been forgiven by God for all of your sins, past, present, and future. That's a tremendous relief, isn't it? To have that burden lifted off of you. And to know that that's, that's what's happened, that God has forgiven you. I mean, that's the greatest feeling you can have to know that all of that's gone. All that's been forgiven. And that guilt needs to go with it. You need to let that guilt go with it. When a Christian continues to carry around that guilty feeling all the time after you've been forgiven of something and you just continue to carry that around with you, again, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's the devil doing that. He's trying to hinder you. He's trying to hold you back. And so let that guilt go. Let that feeling of guilt go because all of your sins are forgiven. That's what it means to have peace with the Lord. Secondly, having real peace in life, real purpose in life, I should say. Having real purpose, knowing where you're going, knowing why you're here. A lot of folks just kind of go through the motions, you know. Most lost people go through the motions. A lot of, a lot of Christians just kind of go through the motions. Think about your week for a moment. What do you do every week? Say, well, I get up and I get dressed, I get ready, I go to work, and I do my job at work, I come home from work. I do some things there. You kind, of, you kind of got a routine that you go through like I do. Or there are certain things you kind of do maybe on certain days. That, you know, it just kind of becomes a routine to you and you kind of go through this thing. And then after a while, don't you get kind of tired, you know, and it kind of becomes a drudgery and all of that. And that's when you got to have a vacation, right? You got to get away from this for a while. I got to go off and just kind of get away from all this routine and everything. Now, we have to do some of that because we have to discipline ourselves and be responsible to provide an income for our families, right? 
But sometimes we get so caught up in the routine of things that it just becomes almost automatic. And we're not really thinking about what's really most important in my life. Am I really tapping into what it is exactly that God wants me to do? Or am I kind of, am I wasting a lot of time? You ever feel like you waste some time? Well, I do. I was, I was looking at this sermon last night and thinking about this and, and thinking, are there some changes that I need to make in my life? And one of them is I need to spend more time with my grandsons, you know. I've gotten into a routine of taking them a couple of times a week, get a Coke, you know, and stuff like that. I see them at church and I'm thankful for that. But we, we don't get to spend as much time as we should together. And I'm like you, I'll kind of convince myself, well, I just, you know, there's some things I just don't have time to do. But that's often not the case. There's a lot of things I do that are just wasteful, just a waste of time, and I can make better use of that time. And I don't want to waste any of the time that I have left. And so I want to do the best I can to, to make the priorities of my life most important. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not going to hang out over at Jennifer and John's house all the time, 24-7. They might get kind of tired of me if I did that, you know. If I'm hanging around my grandsons all the time, you know. Or show up 3 o'clock in the morning, what are y'all doing? You know, let's go out and let's go to the park or something. I mean, you got to be reasonable about it, right? But it just dawned on me yesterday, this, isn't it amazing how quickly time goes by? I mean, it's, it's like a blink and it's gone. I mean, you can't get that back. And I think about the things I do sometimes and it's so stupid, it's so wasteful. You know, watching a rerun of Andy Griffith for the 20th time. I mean, why am I doing this, you know? <laughs> I've got it memorized by heart, you know, but, but I sit there like a zombie and just watch it, you know, and, and you know, and I, I'm, you know, sometimes we're entertained by some things and we like to be entertained again, but I mean, it's just an example. Don't you do the same thing? And why am I, why don't I get in the truck and go over there and let's go play ball or something? Let's go do something, you know. Well, I'm tired, you know, and the TV's on and we waste so much time, don't we? And it's not just family time, it's spiritual things too, don't we? Well, I'm just too tired to read the Bible. I just don't have time for that. It's a hassle, you know. Do I really need to make time to, to pray to the Lord, to spend time in prayer? And Do I really need to make time to get up and get ready and go to church every Sunday? And You know, we, we have these discussions in our heart and minds all the time, don't we? We make decisions all the time. There's a way that God wants us to go in every single aspect of our lives. And a lot of times we get it all wrong. I know in my heart God doesn't want me to just sit there and watch the 20th episode of Andy Griffith. He just doesn't want me doing that. Something else I could be doing. Now don't get me wrong, I know you need some downtime. I know you can't just be working all the time at constantly doing things that are exhausting. You do have to have some time to relax and, and recharge your batteries and the Lord certainly understands that. But we gotta be, we got to be more diligent, don't we, to, uh, to focus on our priorities. At least I know I do. And so, having real purpose in life, knowing why I am here, what is my reason for being on this planet? What does God want to do with me for the days that I have left before I go on to be with Him in heaven? And I, I don't want to miss out on any of that. I want, to, I want to do everything I can to fulfill His purpose and plan for my life. That's so important. And then, true peace involves having a close fellowship with the Lord being really, really close to Him. And sometimes not only do we squeeze our family members out, but we squeeze God out, don't we? Thinking, well, I, I'm just so busy, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to go take care of this, I've got to go take care of that. And we don't spend near enough time in fellowship with the Lord, just fellowshipping with the Lord, praying and studying the Scriptures and seeking His will. And I mean, again, I know from experience, the more you do of this stuff, the more you get into God's Word, the more you get into prayer, the more you get into to submitting yourself to every aspect of His will, the happier you're going to be, the more enlightened you're going to be, the more joy you're going to have in your heart. We know that, but we're stubborn. We're human, aren't we? We just, we resist it. We go the easy way sometimes instead of making the effort to tap into God's will. And so we have to work at it. It takes effort. We've got to reflect on it is, what it is that God wants us to do and how He wants us to do it. And then finally, you need to, you need to be re rejoicing and be happy about what's ahead. Again, you've got this great anticipation, this excitement. 
You ever, uh, you ever plan for a trip way in advance and, and start looking forward to it? You're going to go someplace really neat, someplace really special. It may be a once in a lifetime trip. And so you plan for that and you look ahead and you're thinking about it and you're looking out there and, and the closer it gets, the greater the anticipation gets, right? The greater the excitement, the joy, the thrill. That's the way we ought to think about our lives. We should, we should be excited about what God has for us out there in the future. Be optimistic. Be, be filled with joy and excitement about what's around the corner because God has some amazing things in store for us if we'll just follow His will. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 64, In the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is coming back someday. He said so himself, right? In the future, this is going to happen. I think it could be in the very near future. Jesus Christ is coming back. And so we need to be thinking about that. We need to be excited about that. We need to be enthusiastic about that. We also need to be sober about that and thinking about those who don't know him. And what can I do to reach them and reach out to them and encourage them to come to faith in Christ before it's too late for them? And so that's one aspect of our future that's extremely positive, right? Jesus Christ is coming back. Well, we need him, don't we? We were saying in Sunday school this morning, we're not going to have peace on this earth until Jesus Christ comes back. Not lasting peace, not real peace. There is so much turmoil in the world today. There's so much turmoil in our country. People are at each other's throats. You know, there's so much anger and bitterness and tit for tat and all of that. And there's just so much, so much uh, anger in our country, in our world today. And we're not experiencing peace. And we won't have peace completely and fully until Jesus comes. Now, you can have some peace right now with Jesus, of course, but we're not going to have peace on the earth until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And I believe He's coming back soon. We need to be excited about that. Romans 8, verses 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul said, What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will give us later. He's primarily talking about suffering from persecution, but it could be anything, right? Because we live in a sinful world. So if you're suffering, if you're struggling, if you're having heartache, if you're having difficulty right now, Paul says that's absolutely nothing when you compare it to the glory that you're going to have later on. He's talking about heaven. Talking about being with the Lord throughout eternity. Imagine how wonderful that's going to be. How exciting that's going to be. We ought, to be, we ought to have a lot of anticipation about that, a lot of excitement about looking forward to someday being with the Lord in heaven. He said, For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who His children really are. Someday we're all going to be together as one big family in Christ, and we're going to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. No more trouble, no more heartache, you know, no more plumbing problems, no more car trouble, no more health problems, no more sickness, no more anxiety, no more stress. Just joy and happiness and peace in the presence of God Himself. Isn't that something to look forward to? Isn't that something to think about, to dwell on, to be enthusiastic about? You know, sometimes Christians seem like the most miserable people and it just shouldn't be that way. We should be the happiest people on earth, right? Because we know what's coming. It's just around the corner and it won't be long, right? And so that's what we're looking forward to. That's what's giving us this joy and this excitement. Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.18, he said, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful future He has promised to those He has called. The Lord has called us. He's, he's reached out to us. He's invited us to come into this personal relationship with Him. And we've responded in faith. And because of that, we've been adopted into His family. We are children of the King. And we can look forward to someday being with Him throughout all eternity. Well, that's something to be optimistic about. Something to look forward to. So when you get discouraged and you get down and you know, things aren't going well at work or you're having problems in your family or you're having health struggles or whatever it may be, just remember this is all temporary. This is all very, very temporary and very, very soon we're going to be with the Lord, right? Man, that's exciting. That's good news. You ever think about what a tremendous privilege and blessing it is to be a part of God's family? And how tragic it is that some folks have been left out of that. Some folks have not made that decision. They've been invited, but they haven't made that decision to trust in the Lord. 
My heart's really burdened for folks in my neighborhood and folks that I see every single day that may not know Christ as Savior. And I wonder about them. I wonder about this person. I wonder about that person. Do they know Christ as Savior? Are they going to be with me in heaven with the Lord? We need to be thinking about things like that. The Lord said, look unto the fields that are wide unto harvest. And pray that the Lord will send laborers to go out there and harvest the crop. Bring them in. Invite them to come in and know Christ as Savior. Jesus told a parable one time about a king who gave a big banquet for his son, a wedding banquet. Of course, he's talking about God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Gave this, this big wedding banquet for his son and he told his servants, I want you to go out and invite all the guests to come. Tell them everything's been prepared, everything's ready. I want you to come and celebrate this wedding ceremony with me and my family. This is a very blessed time for us and exciting. And So the servants went out and invited all these folks that had been invited and they didn't come. They were too busy. They had other things to do. And they just really weren't that interested in coming. So they came back and they said, well, all of those that you sent us to invite, they, they wouldn't come. They said, no, we're not coming. Nobody's there. And so the king sent his servants out again. He said, I want you to go out now. And he said, I want you to invite every single person you see. Everybody. Regardless of the, the wealth they may have or how poor they may be. He said, I want you to invite everybody you see to come to this wedding banquet. I want my house to be full. And so the servants went out and they went through the highways and the byways and they invited every single person they came across to come and to enjoy the wedding banquet. And so many, many came, but still some didn't. And so the point of that story that Jesus told is that uh, the Lord has called us the Lord has invited us to come. He wants everybody to be saved. The Bible says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He wants every single person to be saved. But not everybody is saved, right? He gives us freedom of choice to make up that decision on our own, to decide whether or not we'll trust in Him and have faith in Him and believe in Him as our personal Lord and Savior. Jesus said, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. You're chosen because of your faith, your faith in Christ. God knows what you're going to do before you even do it, right? He knows who are his, but he invites everybody to come. If you're a part of that family, you're going to be a part of that wedding celebration, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Boy, you've got a lot to look forward to, a lot to be excited about. If you don't know him, I want to invite you to come and know him this morning. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, just, just come down here and pray with me. And I'll lead you in a simple prayer and you can invite Christ into your life to be your personal Lord and Savior. It's as simple as that. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make, right? If you've made that decision and you're glad you made that decision, say amen. amen. Mm, I guarantee you, nobody's going to regret that decision, right? It's the most important decision you could ever make. And it's so simple. The old devil, he'll try and... Oh, it's more complicated than that. You need to think about this for a while and just, you know, you go home and think about this. And What he's trying to get you to do is forget about it. That's what he's trying to do because he don't want to lose your soul. But if you feel the Holy Spirit calling you this morning, inviting you to come to faith in Christ, you need to come right now. Don't wait. This is the time. Today is the day of salvation, not sometime later. He wants you to come right now and be saved. And so you come. You just come. You say, well, I don't know what to do. Well, you just come down here and pray with me, and I'll, I'll lead you in what to do, okay? And you can make that decision to accept Christ as your personal Savior. It's the biggest decision you could ever hope to make, all right? All right, well, let's all stand and pray.